and staying asleep. Um, so many times people will come in and, and feel very much that they don't have it, but after testing and then you can see what's going on with their breathing and oxygen and everything else, then they say, oh, wow, that's what's waking me up at nighttime. Um, about 30 to up to 75% of Americans have an insomnia, and it depends on which study you look at in terms of what their prevalence is. Um, and it seems to be higher among women and, and older individuals, and stress plays a leaning factor. So medical illnesses and sleep apnea, there are many, many, many. And, we, and, and the literature is, is really just booming. Um, many things are associated with sleep apnea dementia, memory loss, pulmonary hypertension, <coughs> lung problems, stroke, headaches, heart attack, arrhythmias, poor, poor perf performance at work, um, uh, motor vehicle accidents, diabetes, tiredness, fatigue, uh, drowsiness with driving, obesity, hypertension, impotence, and actually I was just, as I was preparing the talk, um, uh, kidney disorder, chronic kidney disease, and polycystic ovarian syndrome are two more to add to the list. Um, in terms of others that are associated with it. This is a striking slide. And um, there are a few that I have in here that, that just sort of, I think, hit home the points that I want to make, and this is sort of one of them. So if you look at cardiovascular disease as a whole and say, okay, well, is sleep apnea playing a role or why should we pay attention to it? You know, what's, what's really the crux of the problem? In somebody who has had a stroke, they have a 60% chance of having sleep apnea. In somebody who has drug-resistant hypertension, which is defined as being on two antihypertensive medicines and still having trouble with, with controlling your blood pressure, 83% chance of having sleep apnea. Obesity, 77%. That's a body mass index of above 30. A lot of us don't think that you know, when we see a person who has a body mass index of 30, we might not think that they're obese. Maybe we say, oh, they're overweight. But technically, that's the definition of obesity. Congestive heart failure, up to 76% of patients have some form of sleep apnea. Pacemakers, about 60%. If you have a pacemaker, 60% chance of having sleep apnea. A atrial fibrillation, 50%. Diabetes, about 50%. All comers in terms of hypertension, 37%. And coronary artery disease, about 30%. Prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea, OSA stands for obstructive sleep apnea. So, so the prevalence um, as a primary diagnosis, they actually looked in 2004, they looked at about 300,000 cases and they found that not quite 3,000 cases had a primary diagnosis of OSA. We normally don't see that. We normally don't see people leaving the hospital having a primary diagnosis of OSA. It's, it's with something else. Um, there was a study done um, in 2010 and it looked at about 200 patients and they found that 81 of them were a high risk for sleep apnea. There was a study that was just done this year, looked at 400 women, completed a survey, then they did testing, sleep testing in every single one of them, and they found that there were 50% of women between the ages of 20 and 70 had an apnea hypopnea index greater than five. And I'm gonna go into that in the next couple of slides in terms of what an apnea hypopnea index is. But it was related to age, obesity, and hypertension. It was not related to sleepiness. It was not related to sleepiness. So the key, one of the key things, and I'll mention this at the very end as well, but one of the key things that I want, like a, 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 a take home message of today is that it's not just sleepiness. It's not just snoring. I think that there are so many diseases, medical conditions that we have that are associated with sleep apnea that we don't realize are associated with sleep apnea. And they may not have the classic, oh, I'm, I'm snoring and I'm tired. Many times they don't have those two things going together in terms of um, uh, what they're coming in and talking to you about. Um, the apnea hypopnea index in this study, if it was greater than 15, 31% of women had that, and an apnea hypopnea index greater than 30, which is considered severe, 14% of women had that. So let's get into what is apnea, what is hypopnea, what is, you know, wh what am I talking about? So this is a, a, a clip from a sleep study. This is a five minute um, recording from one of the sleep studies, and this is completely normal breathing. And 
This, this line right here is the airflow per breath. There's a breath, there's another breath, there's another breath in and out of the nose. The second one is breath, breath, breath in and out of the mouth. This is the chest, this is the belly, down here are your oxygen levels, and this is completely normal breathing. Up here, this is your EEG brainwave activity, and it looks like, well, it's hard to tell, but I think they're in stage two sleep there. Here's somebody who has this obstructive sleep apnea. So it's, re it's defined as repetitive cessations, so no breathing episodes, in breathing, in ventilation, during sleep, and it's caused by collapse of the upper airway. The upper airway is defined as vocal cords to sinuses. So this is your upper airway, and somewhere up there, it's collapsing. And if you look down here at the nose, mouth, chest, and belly areas, you see areas where they breathe. So there's one breath, two breaths, three breaths, four breaths, done. I don't know, maybe that's about 25 seconds of no breathing right there. One breath, two breaths, three breaths, done. No breathing. So this is classic sleep apnea. This is snoring right here after each event. And down here, you can see the oxygen levels. They'll go they'll 96 down to 91, 93 down to 78. So they fluctuate up and down. Uh, an obstructive hypopnea is repetitive interruptions in breathing, in ventilation, during sleep caused by an incomplete collapse of the upper airway. So it's a narrowed upper airway, but it's not totally blocked off. And you see here that here's those, here are those big breaths, one, two, three, but there's some little breaths in here, little breaths, little breaths, little breaths, and then some big breaths again, and then the little breaths. So it's not completely blocking off, but you still can get some very significant oxygen drops at nighttime. I mean, look at this, 90, uh, 83 down to 74% there. Central sleep apnea is another type of sleep apnea. I see central sleep apnea more after stroke patients. I see it more with congestive heart failure patients. And this one is different. If you look at the pattern here, you can see that they're breathing in a crescendo, decrescendo pattern. So small breaths and then bigger and bigger and bigger and then lesser and lesser and lesser and then no breathing. But now you get no breathing through the nose, no breathing through the mouth, and the chest and the belly are not making effort. So they're very, it's very quiet. They're not making effort. And that's your brain stem pretty much telling your lungs, hey, don't breathe right now. What it is is there's an overshooting and an undershooting of breathing. So you breathe too fast, and then everything stops. And then you breathe really fast again. It's like hyperventilating and underventilating back and forth. So the definition of sleep apnea. We already talked about apnea or hypopnea. It has to be 10 seconds um, in length in general or longer. The sleep heart health study um, showed that there was a significant and independent association with cardiovascular disease if you had an oxygen drop of 4% or more. That's Medicare criteria. Has to be, the apnea or hypopnea has to be greater than 10 seconds, and it has to be associated with a 4% or more oxygen drop. Non-Medicare criteria, your anthems, your Harvard Pilgrims, your MVPs, your Tufts, your Aetnas and Cygnas and all that, 3% or more. So they, they, they do a, a, a little less stringent um, uh, qualification. In general, I see a lot of hypopneas, the majority of, of uh, sleep apnea that I see. And then we calculate what's called an apnea hypopnea index, which is basically we count up the number of apneas, count up the number of hypopneas, and find out how many of those are happening per hour <coughs> over the course of the night. An apnea hypopnea index of less than 5 is considered normal. 5 to 14 per hour is mild sleep apnea. 15 to 29 is moderate, and over 30 events an hour is considered severe. In general, if you have an apnea hypopnea index of 5 or more, and you have either daytime sleepiness, you've had a stroke, you've had an, you have an arrhythmia, you have heart disease, you have something else going on, high blood pressure not controlled well, uh, kidney disease, diabetes, whatever, that defines that you can get treatment for it. If you have an apnea hypopnea index greater than five or you know six, and you have nothing else going on, then uh, technically you may not have sleep apnea, but you have to have sort of something, some other comorbidity there. Um, if you have an apnea hypopnea index greater than 15 without anything else, that defines sleep apnea. Yes, you can get treatment. Again, those are sort of Medicare criteria, but the commercial payers 
are a little less stringent in terms of treatment. Um, I have here one out of five adults have mild sleep apnea and one out of 15 have moderate, but honestly, I think that those numbers are old. I don't have any sort of newer studies yet to say exactly how many, but I think that the, the prevalence is much, much more than that now. Um, so this is just uh, a picture of, whoops, it's a little video clip that was just going to show you how the air um, goes in easily when you're not blocked off and, and when you are blocked off in terms of how it's blocked, how the air doesn't get through. So the physiology behind obstructive sleep apnea is you have this small airway, small what they call pharyngeal airway, so posterior pharynx, and it narrows. And what happens is that um, there's an increase in negative pressure when you're awake to keep the airway open. These stimulate the mechanoreceptors in the larynx, which is back in here, and it increases the number of muscles that are recruited to actively work to keep you toned and open. And this maintains your airway. The small airway also causes an increased resistance in the air that's going in and out. Think of resistance as is if, you're, if you're riding a bicycle and you have those nice, slick, fast tires versus riding a mountain bike, the resistance of the mountain bike is more, it's harder to do, right? Versus that nice smooth tire on the other bike. So the resistance increases in your upper airway, so it's harder to sort of get that air in and out. Now when we sleep, we lose those mechanoreceptors. We lose those nice recruitment of the dilator muscles in the neck. We don't maintain a nice open airway. The patency becomes less. We narrow, we have intermittent collapse, we have low oxygen levels, we end up retaining CO2, and we stimulate our ventilatory effort over and over again, which causes arousals and then sleep deprivation. This is kind of a busy slide. The next two sli slides are busy slides, but what I'm just trying to point out here is that cardiovascular disease and sleep apnea, there are many mechanisms by, by how this happens. There's sympathetic activation, which increases your heart rate, so your epinephrine, your norepinephrine. There's cardiovascular variability, higher heart rates, higher blood pressures. There's endothelial dysfunction. There might be some insulin resistance or metabo metabolic dysregulation. There's thrombo thrombosis in the vessels um, maintain, or, uh, caused by plat platelet activation and increased fibrinogen. There's increases in... Um, your intrathoracic pressures. There's oxidative stress with oxygen-free radicals being made and damaging the insides of the vessels, inflammatory markers, and then vasoactive substances. So there's, there's a lot sort of going on behind the scenes, again, that we sort of don't know about, but it clearly affects our vessels and our heart muscle and, and how we um, you know, pump blood around our body. The one thing I wanted to focus on is um, many times I'm asked, why can't I just be on oxygen to, to treat sleep apnea? And the reason why is this slide. Now, again, it's kind of busy, but the main point of this slide is that when you have an upper airway that is occluded or, or narrowed, your diaphragm, which is your main respiratory muscle, usually contracts down, creates a small negative pressure to bring a breath in, and then it relaxes and your breath goes back out. That's normally what happens all the time when we breathe. When we're occluded, when we're closed off here, our diaphragm has to create a very large negative pressure to bring air in against that occluded airway. And when we see that over and over and over again, along with the low oxygen levels, what happens is that the great vessels in the chest and the heart muscle are damaged over time. They become stiff, the heart muscle doesn't work anymore. Our conduction, conduction system in terms of the electrical impulses you know, that, that serve our, our heart to allow it to beat correctly don't necessarily work well anymore. And it causes changes in afterload and preload and atrial size and wall stress and stroke volume. This is just a picture, it's kind of a fuzzy picture, I apologize, but it's a picture of what I just talked about. Here you have that occluded airway, and here you have this increased negative pressure in the chest cavity, and it is causing problems 
with the great vessels and the heart that are seen over and over and over again. So I'm going to now switch to a couple of cases. And um, the first case is kind of long. The second one's a little less, and the third one's less. But um, you'll, you'll sort of see on a regular basis you know, what I see, what I do, and um, have maybe a greater understanding of, of all of this. So DB is a 51-year-old gentleman, and he presents uh, after that he's been told that he has low oxygen levels after his rehab stay for a complex femur fracture after a skiing accident. His wife has complained about his snoring, for lo loud snoring for many years, and it's worse after a couple of beers. Um, he says his sleep is fine. He falls asleep as soon as his head hits the pillow. He gets six hours of sleep a night. That's all I need. He wakes once or twice maybe to go to the bathroom, but he can easily fall back to sleep. A GI doc noted low O2 levels on his screening colonoscopy last year, and he had recommended that he should probably have a sleep study. This is very common in terms of what I see in my office every day. He has a history of hi uh, hypertension, obesity, and he was recently diagnosed with impaired fasting glucose. So his, re his um, fasting glucose was 109, right? It's above 100. And his hemoglobin A1C is 5.9, right? So he's just on the cusp of maybe, you know, diabetes. His father had a, has heart disease. He's alive. He has heart disease. His first heart attack was at the age of 52. His brother had, a heart, had a, a heart attack at the age of 49. He's a director of marketing for a large Boston company. He doesn't exercise because of his commute, long commute each, each way. Um, he drinks a couple alcoholic beverages, has, a, has four or five cups of coffee a day. And this is a good one. And I throw this in there only because I laugh every single time somebody comes in my office and they say this, right? So smoking is different now. All right, I'm, this is, I'm doing an editorial right now. So smoking is different now than it was 30 years ago. And I'm a lung doctor, so I can. So 30 years ago, people smoked, right? A pack a day, two packs a day. We did it all the time. Now it's like, ah, when I go out, I have a cigarette or two. I smoke with my buddies on a Friday night. I'm like, what is that? Smoking is bad. They don't think smoking's bad. It's just, you know, I'm having a couple beers and I have a couple cigarettes and, and that's what I do now. But I don't, st I, don't smoke, I don't smoke every day. So it's very interesting to me um, that smoking in society has changed and we might even see different patterns in the future. Okay, so now back to the case. Um, so his, he, he's, his blood pressure's a little up, 148 over 88. Heart rate okay, BMI 29.4. So not quite obesity. Technically, he's overweight. Um, height 5 feet 10, weight is two, uh, 205 pounds. His O2 set on room air is 98%. He's got a short neck. His neck circumference is 17.5 inches. That's important because for men, seven, over 17 inches, and for women, over 16 inches, tends to set you up for sleep apnea. So 17 and 16 are numbers that we actually measure necks all the time in the office. I wouldn't imagine you guys necessarily do that, but we do it all the time. Um, and he has a crowded, I looked into the back of his throat, he has a malampati score of four, which we'll talk about in a minute. He has a high arch palate and he's, po he's crowded posteriorly. So his diagnostic sleep study showed an apnea hypopnea index of 33.5 per hour and his O2 nadir, the lowest oxygen level, was 74%. He had 31 minutes less than 89%. 89% is the cutoff for qualifying for oxygen according to Medicare. If you're five minutes or more, less than 89%, you can qualify for oxygen at nighttime. So based on this, he has severe sleep apnea, and we treated him with CPAP of 12. This is what his sleep study looked like, right? A lot of those decreased um, breathing episodes in the nose, in the mouth, the chest, the belly, his oxygen levels sort of going up and down. <clears throat> I'm going to do a couple of teaching points here right now. Malin potty score is a way that... If you've ever had a surgery, the, the anesthesiologist will say, can I open your mouth, please? Can I take a look? And the reason why they're looking is that they want to see, see how well you're going to be able to be tubed. Right? That's why they ask you to open your mouth. They're looking at your malampati score. Malampati 1 means that, that um, it's going to be easy. Malampati 4 means potentially hard. And if you're crowded, that's a malampati 3 or 4. And there can be a higher risk for sleep apnea. This is just another way of looking at that air not being able to get in. When you fall asleep at nighttime, you can relax these 
muscles and tongue in the back and it can close off the back of the airway. This is somebody who is overweight. This is an MRI, a sagittal view, so it's right through here, right? And this is um, somebody who um, is not overweight and here's your airway, right? Your epiglottis is right there and they're down into the trachea right there. And here's someone who's overweight and what happens is that you gain muscle in your tongue sorry, you gain uh, uh, adipose tissue or, or uh, fat tissue in the tongue. You also gain it around the neck muscles. It changes the curvature, it changes the structure, and it tends to narrow you. This is CPAP ther therapy. How does it work? CPAP is an air stent. It's either a, uh, a mask that you wear right into the nose, around the nose, or around the nose and the mouth. It blows in air from the environment that has 21% oxygen in it no extra oxygen. It is filtered, humidified, and then it's pushed it in and it holds your airway open so that you can breathe well in and out. And this is no CPAP, and this is somebody who's on CPAP here. You can see that it holds the airway open. And this is a, a picture of the mask. This is a nose mask that is often worn. So, follow-up. He didn't tolerate CPAP well. Now, I, I put this in here not because it's a common thing. Um, if you put somebody on CPAP and they are not followed by somebody who knows what they're doing, they will often put it in the closet. If you are followed by someone who knows what they're doing, and I have to tap, you know, toot my own horn here, I honestly think that there are a few people in the state of New Hampshire that really know CPAP, and I think I'm one of them, that, that if, if you come and you work with me and I work with you, we actually did this two months in a row. There are little data chips in, in the machines, and we looked at the data chips of all of our patients who came in over two months, and the adherence rate was 84% one month and 86% the next month. So if you come to me, if you come to somebody who knows what they're do doing, and they can really help you, 85% adherence rate in terms of getting benefit. So anyway, he didn't tolerate it very well. So the reason why I, I um, brought this to your attention is because I, I wanted just to show you or mention uh, other things that could potentially be um, used to treat sleep apnea. And one of the things that's kind of a second best is, is a group of, of devices called mandibular advancement devices or splints. And the one that he was fitted with, with was called the Thornton Adjustable Positioner. We offer them at our office. Um, and his follow-up diagnostic polysomnogram didn't quite get him to normal, but near. He was about nine events an hour, and his lowest oxygen level you know, wasn't 74% anymore. It was 87%, and it was only about a minute. So this really helped him. OK, some more teaching points. Um, prevalence of hypertension in our society over the age of 55 is approximately 50%. So one out of two Americans over the age of 55 have high blood pressure. There is this thing called blood pressure dipping. So normally when we sleep, here is your systolic right there, here is your diastolic, and here is your mean arterial pressure. And when we sleep, which was the gray part right here, we find that there is a dipping that happens in your systolic blood pressure. If you have sleep apnea, you lose blood pressure dipping, and it is associated with an increased cardiovascular risk. This slide just shows that if you have an increase in your blood pressure, 20 over 10, there's a doubling of um, mortality risk as you, as you keep going up twofold, then fourfold, then eightfold. This is showing you that um, if you have severe sleep apnea compared to somebody who doesn't have severe sleep apnea, if you look at, say, 12 years right here, there is, if you don't have sleep apnea, there's approximately 20% incidence of hypertension versus somebody who has severe sleep apnea here. Hypertension, we already know that there's a close association. Um, they, uh, this report here said 50% of OSA patients have hypertension and 30% of hypertensive patients have sleep apnea. I think I stated earlier it was about 37%, so it's in that ballpark. Um, when you, when you put somebody on CPAP uh, pressure to um, treat their sleep apnea, their blood pressures tend to be less, tend to be less. Mean arterial pressure may go down by two to four millimeters of mercury. It's not huge, 
Sometimes I don't see big changes in blood pressure after I put somebody on CPAP, but sometimes I do. Sometimes I, do, I see it come down 10 points, 12 points. And I don't know, who, I don't know how to predict who's going to benefit and who's not besides putting them on it. Um, this is another key slide. I actually have this in my office and I show it to people fairly regularly. It's mortality and sleep apnea. So this one shows that at approximately 15 years, if you have severe sleep apnea, which is this red line, at about 15 years, 60% of people are alive. That means 40% have died. Untreated severe sleep apnea, vascular events. And if you look at the red line, that's the severe sleep apnea. At 12 years, over 30% have had a non-fatal cardiovascular event. What is that? That's the heart attack they survived. That's the AFib that they developed. That's the diabetes that they, that they have. That's the hypertension that they've been diagnosed with, or that's the stroke that they just had. So it's some sort of cardiovascular event that has happened to them. And in this study, they actually showed mortality was a little bit less. At 12, at, uh, 12 years there, it was probably about 18% for severe sleep apnea. Um, so if you take all comers with severe sleep apnea, and 40% are passing away at 15 years, and another 30 or 35% are surviving their event, approximately 75% of people who have severe sleep apnea are going to have something in about 15 years. Now granted, it's 15 years, but we don't know when that time zero is. When somebody comes to my office and they're 50 years old, have they had it for 20 years already, or did they quit smoking and gain 80 pounds and just get it over the last two years? I don't know. I don't, I, they all ask me, everybody always asks me, how long have I had this? And I, I can never give them a good answer. Um, I'm just going to focus on the uh, uh, highlighted areas of, the, of these, these slides. So in general, um, there's a decreased occurrence of cardiovascular death, heart attacks, heart failure, um, if, and revascularization once somebody has had a stent or open heart surgery. If you treat the sleep apnea, they will have less events after that. This one specifically looks at treating sleep apnea after they've had a stent. So percutaneous intervention is a stent, PCI is a, after having a stent. And if you treat the sleep apnea after they've had their stent, you're going to reduce cardiac deaths. Um, so treatment of sleep apnea, specifically obstructive sleep apnea, positive airway pressure, which is CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure. There's BiPAP or a bi-level therapy. It's also called VPAP. Weight loss, positional sleep, if it's mostly on their back and less or not on their sides at all, we might talk about weight loss and positional sleep. Um, the mandibular advancement device or splint that I talked about a little earlier, showed you pictures of that. Um, I'm coming up here, I'm going to show you a, picture, a couple pictures of that. There's surgery, electrical stimulation of the upper airway musculature is a new thing and they're just looking at it now in the literature. And then there's nasal um, expiratory positive uh, airway pressure, which I'm not going to get into because it actually, I think it doesn't work very well. Um, these, these are the mandibular advances that are out on the market. And again, there are many, many, many out there. Um, and I don't have any uh, uh, specific um, alliance to any one, except for just recently, uh, when I went to the conference in, in June, I actually went to different tables and talked to them about their oral appliances. And I've decided because I liked the design of the TAP Elite. I'm, gonna, I'm using this one in my office right now um, because it's more streamlined. The one that I have in there is called the Somnigard, which is actually right next to it. And it's bulkier, and it didn't do well with my women. It did fine with the men, but the women, they have smaller mouths. Um, so I ended up uh, choosing the to have both of them, the TAP Elite, um, so that it would be more streamlined and fit the women better if they wanted that as an option. Okay, so let's go over case number two. <coughs> C CW is a 72-year-old woman who presents for evaluation of sleep apnea after being discharged from a rehab place facility. She had a prolonged hospitalization for congestive heart failure. Um, her blood sugars have been difficult to control and she was recently started on insulin. Um, she's had no problems with sleep. Doesn't know why she's here. Again, 